Hi everyone, John here from All Miniatures Great and Small, and today we're going to be doing a rules overview of Black Seas. It's an Age of Sail battle game from Warlord Games covering the um, sailing ships, the beautiful sailing ships from 1770 to 1830. So it's covering things like the American Civil War, um, the Napoleonics, War of 1812, you got all of those kind of things going on here. French, British, American, Spanish. Um, it's pretty cool stuff. All right. All right, the first thing we are going to talk about are the ships itself. You need playing pieces to play. Now, these are a couple of examples of ships. This is a brig, which is kind of a smaller ship. It's the smallest ship in the starter box, but there are smaller ships in the game. Then you have a fifth ray frigate. Um, this is also in the starter box. You get three of these, you get six of those. Um, and it's a pretty generic frigate. Then you have, this is an example of one of the hero ships that they sell. This is the USS Constitution, which is basically a super frigate, if you will. And before we can get into how the game plays, we need to understand this information about our ship. All right, so this is the uh, generic fifth rate for any nation, not French, not British, it's just that. So we have the uh, ship's turning angle, this red chevron here. That is, um, it's either gonna be red or yellow, and we'll explain what that means later, but so we know the turning angle is red for him. Then we have the armament, which are these cannon icons along the uh, sides of the ship and the front of the ship in this case. So for example, he has two heavy guns, one light cannon and one carronade, which is kind of a short range, high strength cannon. And then in the front, kind of as a bow chaser, you've got a single one strength light gun. Then same thing on the, the you know, they match. So two heavy cannon, one light cannon, one carronade. So that's the weapons, which correspond to the number of dice you're gonna be throwing. So the heavy cannon, the big gun is represented by blue dice. The light cannon is represented by red 10-sided die. And the carronades are represented by black 10-sided dice. So you can throw all your dice together and know which ones, um, you know, which hits, which ones hit, which one misses. Because the different cannons, heavy cannons do more damage than light cannons, for example have different range, so there, there's reasons why you need to know that. All right, next thing is we have the rate of knots, which is this number here in the sail. So number five is, that is a uh, rate of knots, which corresponds to inches moved. We'll talk more about that when we cover the movement phase. Then we have the ship points, which is in this ship's wheel. So this has basically 36 hull points. Then we have this little flag here, which is the break value. And uh, this is where the ship is going to start uh, considering surrendering. So you, you got 36 hull points. When you're down to 12, um, you start thinking about surrendering. Um, those are the main uh, features of the card. Then along the top and bottom, you do have this damage track. I'm not sold on it yet, but that's on 30, that's on 6, and lets you slide. So you can keep track of how much damage um, your ship has taken. Cool, cool idea. Um, that's just a little paper, um, but um, you know, I wish that window was a little bit bigger, but uh, you get the idea. It tells you how much damage, and that is the ship card. Next, there are a lot of tokens with the game. Uh, damage tokens, upgrade tokens, turn marker tokens. We'll talk about those a little bit later, the ones that are kind of relevant to, to a beginner. The Master and Commander starter set, again, comes with all the stuff you're gonna need, um, even the dice and a cool battle mat. I am using a different battle mat. This is a neoprene uh, battle mat, uh, but same thing. They recommend you play on a four by three uh, table, which is um, a, a pretty standard size. Four by six for larger games is what they recommend. So, you know, they're not reinventing the wheel there. Next up, let's talk turn sequence. So there are basically eight phases to the game. Phase one is roll for wind direction. Phase two is determine the weather gauge order. 
three is activate a ship as dictated by the weather gauge order. Number four is resolve shooting. Number five is resolve boarding actions. Six is mark the activated ship as done basically. Uh, seven is just repeating phases three through six for each ship. And then uh, the last phase is just removing all the ship activation counters. So we're just gonna go over each one of those um, phases so you can see how the game kind of hangs together. First phase of the game is determining the wind direction. So every scenario will tell you which uh, direction the wind is going to start with initially. Um, all you do is you look at this chart, we'll have it pop up on the screen, and you roll two dice and you compare it to the chart. Now for the majority of the time the wind's going to stay the same. It's only if you roll an extreme that something's going to happen. So typically uh, 4 through 10 is no change, 3 and 11 it's going to change by one direction and then I think 2 and 12 are uh, be calm so the wind dies down and 12 is there's a gust so you go a little bit faster. So no dramatic changes can happen with the wind gauge to totally mess you up. Um, at most it's ever going to go one spot so north to northeast or north to northwest um, per turn. Next we determine the weather gauge order. So basically this is like initiative in other games. So you look at the direction that the wind is blowing so it's going that way from basically this table edge the ship that is closest to the wind is going to be activated first. So he's going to go, then he's going to go. Alright, so let's focus into this French ship, this French frigate. He's going to activate uh, first. We've moved him closer to the wind for this example. So when you activate a ship, uh, there's a sequence of things you're going to do. You're going to check the attitude of the wind, declare level of sail, uh, move a certain number of times based on your level of sail and then at the end of each of those moves you may turn um, and at the end of each of those moves you can fire some or all of your weapons and then at the end you can make a boarding action so that's um, the activation of a ship in a nutshell so in the basic game there are basically four wind directions you need to worry about when you start your turn um, and that direction of the wind determines the maximum speed you can set your sails, full sails, battle sails, light sails. Now I recommend you guys use the advanced rules. Um, the wind is the one thing that makes this type of game different from other ship games. Um, and the advanced rules really aren't that um, complex. They don't add a lot of complexity as far as the wind goes, uh, but it does add a little bit more realism. So in the basic game, I'll just describe the basic game, the wind can hit your ships uh, one of four ways. From either side, from the stern, or from the bow. Now if it hits you from the stern, your maximum theoretical speed is full sails. If it hits you from the side, your max speed is battle sails. And then if it hits you from the front, you're going to be anchored or you can attempt to tack, which is basically uh, a way a, sh a sailing ship can sail up the wind by basically zigzagging. Um, tacking does take some skill though, so you're going to have to make a skill check or you're going to be anchored or in irons is the, the historical phase for, phrase for that. Um, the other thing is too, if you start your turn relative to the wind and you're going too fast, um, it will slow down. So let's say your frigate ended last turn like this, but it's going full sails. Well, at the start of this ship's activation, I'm going to look and I'm going to see, well, it's hitting the side, so the maximum speed is battle sails. So I have to immediately change my move to battle sails and that's going to be my movement for this turn. When you are activated and facing into the wind you need to tack which is a skill test 
veteran screw uh, veteran crews do this on a four plus five plus for regular and and a six for inexperienced crews so basically you roll the die so I failed so if I fail my ship becomes anchored so its speed is zero and I can't do any moves I can't move at all this turn now let's say I'm a veteran crew and I roll the four so what happens then is then I can tack which means that um, I can turn the minimum amount needed to take me just out of the wind even if that exceeds my normal um, turn angle with the, the turn gauge so basically if I passed it I could turn my ship so that it's hitting the side now and that's a minimum amount of move um, to make that happen all right let's put all of that into effect and perform movement for this frigate so the wind is blowing north this direction it's hitting the side of my ship so my maximum speed is battle sails so we're gonna say I'm at battle sails or I went down to battle sails but I'm still at battle sails so basically I get two moves so my first move is going to be five inches and I can choose to turn or not so let's say this privateer here is what I'm going after so I don't want to turn I want to keep going so at this point I'd have the opportunity to shoot so I'm gonna forego my shooting I'm gonna make my second move because I'm at battle sails so it puts me there let me change my camera a little bit there we go so this is the end of my second movement and again I have a second firing opportunity but before I do that I could choose to turn and maybe I'm gonna turn a little bit so I get my turn dial and I turn that way so that's where I'm gonna end and you notice now the wind next turn is gonna be hitting the rear of my sail or ship so I'm gonna theoretically go up to full speed if I want to uh, but you don't have to so now I've completed my movement and I've gotten myself in a good position to shoot this privateer so now that I moved my ship we go to the shooting phase so the firing arcs are a little bit interesting you do typically have broadsides and that's your heavy hitters that's typically just an arc a line I'm going to use these provided rulers as an example that's just the width of your ship so that is the arc of fire for your broadsides you have a front arc of fire which matches the yellow turning tool so you have a front arc because remember our frigate has one light gun firing to the front so in theory a ship could have multiple uh, firing positions they could have they obviously have two broadsides this guy has one to the front some ships could have some cannons to the back so theoretically you could fire all of your gun positions so I could fire both broadsides for example or both broadsides on my front gun but eventually there's going to be a penalty for firing uh, more than one gun battery so the first thing you're going to do is allocate each gun position to a target so normally you have to target the closest um, ship enemy ship in the uh, firing arc so I have to target this guy because he's the closest if I am a veteran crew I can make a skill test to target someone else who is farther away so on a 4 plus which is veteran skill um, I could shoot uh, another ship that was here skipping that one if I wanted to um, then you measure the range heavy cannons have a 20 inch range light cannons 14 carronades 8 um, so you figure out how many obviously in this example everything's going to be in range um, then you look at your two hit numbers basically your two hit number you start with a five or less you're going to hit with your ten-sided die uh, five or less then you modify that uh, hit number by various factors things like range crew 
speed, target size, whether you're aiming high at the sails or aiming at the hull. So let's say in this case, this is my only target. So I am firing just one gun position, so there's no modifier. The range is less than 10 inches. But I am at point blank range. The target is within three inches of the gun position. Then I've got um, a crew. We'll just say we're a regular crew now. So no modifier. We're at battle sails, so we don't have any speed modifiers. And we're shooting at a small ship, which is minus one to hit. And then uh, that's going to be everything that we've got. So normally we'd have a five. We're at point blank range, so we're getting a plus two, and we are shooting at a small ship, which is minus one. So that balances out to a uh, plus one modifier to our dice. Okay, so what do we roll? Well, we're within range for all of our guns, so we're going to get two heavy guns, two, or sorry, one light gun, and one carronade die. So again, the base two hit number is five. But we ended up with a plus one with our modifier, so our base to hit number is now a six. So we need six or less to hit with these dice. So we're gonna go ahead and roll them. And we've got a four, a six, a five, and an eight. So basically the eight misses, and conveniently enough, we've got one hit with each type of cannon. Now I will point out, if we had rolled a 1 on any one of these dice, we would have rolled on the critical table. It would have counted as a critical hit. So we're going to go ahead and say this was a 1. We're really picking on this poor brig. And then resolve our fire that way. Now here's where things get kind of cool because this would be a raking shot. Which means basically the target is perpendicular to the firing ship, or at least is you know, there's, they do allow some slight leeway, but the idea is the cannon is traveling the whole length of the ship doing a lot more damage than if it had come in at a different angle like from the side. So if you are within three inches and you are firing into the stern of the ship like a rake, like you see here in this example, you triple the damage that is applied to it. So the heavy cannon does two damage. So that's tripled to six damage. The light cannon does one, so that's three damage. So that's nine so far. And then the carronade does three, so that's another nine damage. So that's 18 damage uh, to the brig, which is a pretty heavy hit. Now, so what we do then is we take our card, and they have 20 hull. So we would be using our little counter to say, well, now we have two hull points left. Now, we also rolled this one. So we're gonna consult the critical hit table. The critical hit table is a die six. We roll a d6 and we got a three. So with a three, we put a rudder hit marker by our victim and the next time that ship activates, you roll a D3. You can use Warlord Games handy D3 or just have a D6. And then on a one or two, you have to turn to the left, your maximum uh, turn distance. I think uh, three, four, it's you have to move straight ahead and five, six, you have to turn the other direction. So each one of these gives you a flavorful uh, damage to your ship like rudder hit. Some of the other ones would be like crew hit or fire on board or gun deck hit, things like that. Also note, most critical hit effects um, only last one turn. I believe there's only one, maybe two, like uh, sails that carry over turn, uh, turn by turn, representing your sail, you know, a mast getting knocked down or something along those lines. But for the most part, um, these effects, like rudder hit, is only going to last one turn, and then it will be removed after he activates. 
Next, let's talk about uh, an advanced rule that you might want to start playing with right away, just because it's a cool rule and really helps with the flavor of the game, and that's called Fire As She Bears. So, normally, the normal rules have you move, and only at the end of your move do you have the opportunity to fire. Um, now, you still have a couple of opportunities to fire at the end of each of your moves, twice if you're going battle sails, for example. However, um, Fire If She Bears is a little bit different. So let's say at the start of my frigate's move, this fellow is right here. If I complete my move, I'm going to go from here to here. And at that point, I've lost my broadside shot. So rather, I can fire as she bears and use that rule basically marking where I would go, so I'm going to end up here, but as I move, I'm going to choose to fire right there. So by firing right there, I haven't completed my move yet, and I make my firing action. Now, there is a penalty for using fire she moves. It does add two to the um, difficulty of the shot, but it does let you take a shot that otherwise you might have missed. Um, so Fire She Bears allows you more realistically as you're sailing along that line, you fire at the most opportune moment. Now there is the um, ability to use fire as you moves on your opponent's turn. So let's say this um, brig is here, and if the frigate's moving from here to here, it's basically jumped over his broadside arc. So as this ship is sailing along this line, the player, the owner of this ship, could declare fire as she bears, even though it's the frigate's turn. So you can say fire as she bears, right there, and fire before the ship completes its move. Again, there's a, a increase of two to the difficulty of that shot, but it lets you take that shot. So in essence, you could say, you know, I'm going to move five inches, but I'm going to stop here, fire as she bears, and the opponent could say fire as she bears. Both of these ships could fire, and then this ship could complete its move. Now, when you use uh, fire as she bears, you are going to want to mark that that happened. The rule book suggests that you use uh, if it's not your turn and you use fire as she bears, you use a piece of black um, wool here. And then if it was the player's turn, we would have done something like that. Not only does that look cool, like it actually fired, but it serves as a marker to let you know that they have shot this turn. So this guy's not going to forget and try to shoot his starboard broadside again. That, that one's done. The reason why they say use black in this case is because when this ship activates, you're going to basically replace the black with white to let you remember that that battery shot during your opponent's activation, so I can't shoot it again during my activation. So I switch the black to white, I make my moves. Now I could still go like this and fire my other broadside. But this does count, the port broadside does count as having been fired and added to all that you're going to be firing in that turn. So keep in mind, you can use fire she bears, but um, it means you're giving up your shot during your turn to shoot during your opponent's. Next we have collisions. So collisions are a potential part of movement. Here I have my brig and there is a frigate in my way. So normally that for, uh, the brig is going to move five inches, which would put them over here, but we can see that the frigate is in my sailing path. So what happens is you have to evade. Both ships in this case have to uh, attempt to evade, so they both roll a skill test. Um, so each player rolls a skill test. Now if the, um, if the ship is too levels smaller than the other ship and th that's not the case here like if this was a large and this was a small then the small guy would be able to add plus two to this die roll 
As it is, just by default, the skill test for evading gives you a plus one, so it's a little bit easier uh, to evade. So a regular crew would evade on a, normally a five is their skill check, five plus, would do it on a four plus. So he would fail, and oh, they both failed in this case. So if both ships fail their evade test, and it has to be both ships, then the two ships collide. And there is a collision chart where you look at the size of the attacker ship, he's counted as the attacker because he's moving, which would be small, versus a medium-sized ship. Um, so in this case, the medium-sized ship would take six damage, and the small ship would take 10 damage. So the smaller the ship uh, is, the more prone you are to, to taking some damage in, in this case. Also, if the ship has moved more than eight inches in its last or current activation, add three to the damage that is uh, done to the enemy. Once you've applied damage, then you're going to be moving the ships basically broadside to broadside by the minimum amount of movement necessary. So really just kind of bringing them together, something like that. Um, then this ship can now complete its movement. So it is important to know, okay, I moved two inches before I uh, collided with that ship. I still have three more inches to go. For this particular activation. Now after a collision, um, it said that you know the, sh the ship is kind of freaking out, they just crashed, the crew is trying to recover, so you apply the effects of a quarter deck critical hit. In addition, you cannot, he cannot uh, shoot or initiate grapples. And I guess that's going to be true for both of these ships. And the quarter deck hit is basically um, you need to make a skill check and you cannot change direction or level of sails unless you pass that skill check and if you fail it uh, you have to move in a straight line and you are suffering a minus one penalty to hit so it's kind of kind of rough but uh, you've collided and that's the consequence of that so it doesn't happen too often because both ships you know roll that die and both ships have to fail for the collision to, to happen. Um, if one of them passes, then, we'll go back to our starting spots. So let's say he rolls a five, he fails with a two. We, um, we activate, and if we, if our ending spot clears the ship, we're good. So that's my five inches. If the activating does not clear the ship, so let's say I'm moving five inches, which would put me right about here. Can't do that, obviously, so I'm gonna stop short. You only place them on the far side if you have enough movement in inches to kind of make that hurdle. Otherwise, and then he stays um, pretty much unscathed. Next, we're going to talk about boarding actions. Boarding is something that has uh, happened a lot in the Age of Sail, so we want to make sure that it's uh, represented and uh, we get that right. So, um, basically, boarding happens uh, when you successfully grapple an enemy ship. So, what you need to do is you can attempt to grapple at the end of your last movement. So, if we assume this frigate has already moved once at battle sails and this is his second and therefore last move at battle sails we're going to move him his five inches so normally here he would get a shot and can fire his cannons and then he can attempt to, to grapple the opposing ship now i did have to go to the warlord games black sea facebook page to uh, find the answer to the question I had which was it's not quite clear in the rule book if you can fire before attempting to grapple it says at the end of a movement every movement you can fire and at the end of your last movement you can attempt to grapple and you can also attempt to fire 
So the uh, the writer of the rules, Gabrio Tolentino, I believe, um, did answer that question saying, yes, you shoot first and then grapple board second. So you could cruise on up, blast away with your guns, and then attempt a grappling if you are within three inches of your target. And I'll point out tactics-wise that if you're using fire as she bears, there's no reason for this guy not to fire back before that grappling attempt attempt if it is possible. To grapple, you make a skill test. So this is his activation. He's going to attempt to grapple that brig and he rolls, hey, exactly what I needed. We'll assume, well, it's what I needed if he is a uh, veteran crew. He need a four plus. Regular would need a five plus. Inexperienced would need a six to successfully grapple. So once they successfully grapple, they come to a stop and you move them side by side so that uh, the minimum amount required to make that happen. So basically something like that. So now our two ships are grappled together and we can now have boarding continue. Now here's where the boarding uh, action begins and the fun begins. So basically first you're going to figure out how many dice you're going to get to roll. The way you do that is you look at the number of hull points you have here, so 36 for a frigate. You divide that by 10, rounding up. So in this case, my frigate has 36 hull points remaining, so we're going to have four dice. The brig has 20 hull points, so divide by 10, rounding up, that's going to give me two dice. So that's the number of dice you're going to roll for this particular boarding action. Now if it's the first boarding action, like our example here, the activating ship, which is the frigate, is going to get to add plus one to their dice rolls. Well, actually to the, the value needed to hit. Now normally veterans are going to roll and hit on a six or less. They need to get six or under. Whereas these uh, regular brigs are going to uh, brig is going to need five or under, so six or under. But because it's the first round of attack for him, the very first activation for this boarding, I'm going to get to add plus one to the number I need to hit. So instead of a six, I need a seven. It's a weird way of doing it um, because in this game we're rolling under instead of over our target number, but. Um, that's good. Alright, so we're going to go ahead and roll. So this is against the brig. And we got a 10, a 9, a 1, and a 3. So this is good. If we roll a 1, we count that as a critical hit. And we reduce the number of ship points by 4. And this is just a regular hit. It's under the 7 we needed, but it's not a 1. So we're going to drop our target ship down by 2. So the critical hits 4, 2, so we do 6 points of damage to that brig. Now the brig gets to swing back and uh, they were looking for a five or less for their regular crew so they miss with one and hit with one. It is not a critical hit so the frigate takes two points of damage. The ship that took the least amount of damage is considered the winner so in this case it's our frigate. So now we have to look at the losing ship which is our poor brig and we've been picking on all, all example here. And we need to see if this damage that we took drops him to half of his starting hull points. So if he got to uh, 10 or under, he would make a skill check to see if he surrenders. So pass the skill check or surrender. If you get below the break flag here, the uh, 7 in this case for the brig, um, you automatically surrender. So the ship would automatically surrender. In this case we started with 20, we took 6, so this ship has 14 left, so it doesn't need um, to t even test for surrendering yet. Alright, so now let's say uh, activation is passed and now it is the brig's turn to move. Um, she could stay and keep trying to fight and we would do the same thing um, the frigate would still get four dice, the brig would still get two dice because it's divide hull points by ten, rounding up. Um, but the um, brig could also attempt to disengage. To disengage, 
you have to pass a skill test, uh, which allows the ship to move, which is and it follows all the normal movement rules. Uh, but it's only going to be able to move with light sails on the first move, and it's not going to be able to shoot. So um, it's going to be a little bit tough. If the ship is been reduced less to half of its original uh, hull points, then you're going to add plus two to the uh, the skill. If a ship has surrendered, you can move away without having to make a skill test. So if this brig has surrendered and we go back to the frigate's activation, it can move off normally without having to make a skill test. One last thing to note is on the next turn, when these ships are you're determining the weather, sorry, the wind direction and who has the weather gauge. Um, you almost treat these as like one unit. So if these guys are going to activate, they're going to activate and the order between them is the ship that is um, the, the better experience is going to go first. And if the two ships are the same experience, they're both veteran, then the ship that initiated the grapple is going to go first. So the uh, frigate would go first on the next turn and it could be a case where then the frigate goes and then immediately the brig would go if it hasn't surrendered yet or it could try to, to break off and run away. So there you go that's uh, boarding actions for uh, Black Seas. So that is the basic game pretty much in a nutshell. There are certain things uh, to remember and probably the most important is the weather gauge. The weather gauge is going to be, uh, you know, proper use of the weather gauge and timing is going to be, that's how you're going to win or you're going to lose. So it's important to always keep that in mind. And that's really cool because that's, again, one of the defining characteristics of Age of Sail is who can work with the wind the best. Um, there are a lot of advanced rules and additional rules which we did not cover because we don't want to be here all day. But if you're interested in the game, um, you have more rules to make it more, um, you know, to add more realism to your game. And that include, includes things like um, ships catching fire, different ammunition types like uh, chain shot or double shot, things like that. Um, the um, rules that I recommended you use from the get-go, fire as she bears, the advanced uh, wind rules, those are, are in there as well as, as long as much you know as well as other advanced rules. So there you are folks that is a simple how to play Black Seas the Age of Sail game from Warlord Games. I hope you enjoyed this um, again obviously I didn't cover every single rule there are lots of rules for you to discover on your own if this is the kind of game that seems like you might be interested in. Uh, but we covered all the basics, and uh, hopefully it gives you a good um, idea of what this game is about and how the rules work, and uh, I hope you enjoyed it. So please do let me know down in the comments below. Um, have you played this game? Do you like it? Does it look interesting? Do you like Age of Sail? Uh, always interested in hearing about that and talking with the community. As always, thanks for watching, and keep on wargaming.